All right, we're in the book of Ruth, as we've been for a few weeks now, continuing on. We're in chapter 2, uh, around verse 14 is where we'll pick up today <clears throat> and continue our discussion of, of the book of Ruth. What's happened up to this point, Ruth has been gleaning in the field. She's been noticed by Boaz. Uh, he does his, for lack of a better term, investigation of what's going on with her and who she is and all that kind of things and uh, has reached the point where he knows who she is and is impressed by her and all of that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, verse 14, Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed parched grain to her and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. Also let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean. And do not rebuke her. So he, she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. And her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. So she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. And again, we've talked about the, the process of, of gleaning and, and what that meant for the poor and the widows and all of that. They could come into the field and what was dropped on the ground or what was left. Uh, they had every right to take. And that was God's promise uh, to Israel that if you would do that then the poor would have what they need plus the promise implied in that that you as the producers of that crop would have all you need even though you leave some of it behind and that was kind of the promise he'd given them when they went into the land as long as you do my will you don't have to worry about that I'll take care of that you'll get rain you'll get uh, everything you need for a proper harvest if you do my will and <clears throat> unfortunately for this time in the period of history, again, Ruth took place during the days of the judges, so that wasn't always the case. And the famine in the land, when they had to go to Moab at the beginning of the book, uh, was likely a re part of that reason why they had to leave, because God wasn't blessing them the way he promised, because they weren't being faithful the way they had promised. And so it's that uh, relationship back and forth between them that <clears throat> led to that. But seemingly at this time, after that famine was over, and again, we don't know when this was. We don't have any way of putting a, a timeline with it and say, okay, this took place during this judge or between this judge and this judge. Uh, it'd be nice to know that, but we don't know that. And so we have to just deal with that. <clears throat> and so Boaz is impressed with, with Ruth, and he's giving her every benefit that he possibly can. And that includes going beyond what was required of him as far as just letting her glean in the field to actually telling, well, you notice there, verse 16, also let grain from the bundles fall purposefully for her. So it wasn't a, it wasn't that they just handed it out, they sacked it up for it and gave it to her. But I, I kind of have a picture, they're loading things on a wagon on a cart, and, and one of the guys who's doing that just maybe kicked one off and left it there in the field. I don't know how it worked, but, but that kind of seems to me how what was going on there. And Again, they were told, if you leave a sheaf in the field, what do you do with it? You don't go back and get it. Drop a cluster of grapes, you leave it. Uh, and again, that was for the poor. And so this was taking that one step further and purposefully leaving things for Ruth so that she could she could glean. She ate till she was satisfied, and she was able to keep some back for, uh, for Naomi so she could take to her and take care of her because that's why she's out there, not only for herself, but she's taking care of the family. And taking care of their responsibilities so they have food to eat and all that that's, that's going on there. So uh, we kind of went through most of that last week. Any questions, comments, anything you wanted to say about that before we, we move on? Jim? Okay, yeah, ephah is about a bushel. That trying to, you know, compare weights, it's kind of hard to do that because, but people who are a lot smarter than me who study stuff like that uh, agree that it's about a, a bushel of, of wheat. So it's pretty good amount it's not just not just a little bag full but uh, enough to to be used in baking and cooking and all of that uh, significantly for them uh, in what she's doing so um, we go on into verse 19 and her mother-in-law said to her where have you gleaned today and where did you work blessed be the one who took notice of you so she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. 
And so, again, we, we discussed this a little bit last week, that the, this wasn't just always, as we might think, happenstance. It wasn't just chance that she ended up at Boaz's field. We talked about the hand of God was probably in that. And it may have been, the text doesn't tell us, that Naomi knew who Boaz was and maybe even directed her to that, that field and, and that area. Again, we don't know. We're just guessing at that point in time. Uh, but she said, I work with Boaz. Uh, Blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. A um, little bit of discussion there as to exactly who she's talking about. Uh, the wording there, blessed be he of the Lord. Is it Boaz she's talking about? Could be. Uh, and that seems to be the, the indication, but there are some who take that to be no. What she's saying here is blessed be he of the Lord, speaking in the sense of God himself, who uh, is not forsaking his kindness to the living and the dead. Let's assume that for a minute. Uh, and again, I, I don't know. I think just the, the grammar itself, the way it is, she's talking probably about Boaz. But leaving that aside for a moment and saying, okay, she's saying, blessed be the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. What's significant about that statement at this point in time? She knows that the Lord has a part in it. Okay, she knows the Lord has a part in it. Robin? And to that, that bloodline, the, the, that dead husband, uh, lineage is going to be continued. Yeah, lineage is going to be continued. She knew it was of the Lord. Significantly think about her mind. Go ahead, Les. Well, it speaks of the resurrection. Okay, speaks of the resurrection, the living and the dead. And so a foreshadowing of something to come. All right, what else? Think about Naomi's mindset prior to this. She got back to Bethlehem, and what did she say? Mm -hmm. Blessed be the Lord. He's done so good to me. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, call me, don't, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Call me bitter, because the Lord's dealt harshly with me, to put it in, in one word. And we, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the list of things she said that the Lord had done to her and done to her as a result of what all had happened. Again, thinking about that, if she's talking about the Lord, does that might maybe signal a, a change in her attitude, her mindset, her heart about that? Well, that, that would seem to be a, a logical conclusion to that. So she's had... She lost her husband. She lost her sons. She was by herself. Now she's home, and things are looking up. And as a result of that, she may be, and again, we're just, this is just assuming that's what it's meant by that. We're assuming that she's beginning to see that that, shall we say, woe is me attitude uh, may not have been entirely justified in her life that she maybe had, as we've talked about before, the little blip in her faith, a little dip in her faith, a little challenge to her faith. And as a result of that, now that she's seeing this, she's beginning to, shall we say, put two and two together and say, oh, wait a minute, the Lord is blessing me. All this that has happened since I come back, I've been welcomed into town, uh, found Boaz, he's taken kindly to Ruth. Maybe this is the way it was supposed to be, and she's getting back to being that faithful person she had once been. Vicki? Well, I think we ought to give <clears throat> Naomi a little benefit of the doubt, because sure. when she spoke those words, she was grieving. Mm -hmm. And I'm no counselor, but one of the stages of grief is anger. Sure. So she was angry, and she kind of took that anger sure. out of God. But maybe mm -hmm. now enough time has gone by that she's in another stage of grief right. and is more able to accept. Sure, yeah, that. and and you know, by no means are we criticizing Naomi for saying that. Well, we've talked about several times before in the class that, you know, when bad things happen to us, it's just natural for us to do what? The question. And say, okay, God, I don't get this. I don't know why you're doing this. I don't know why you're allowing this. Uh, but I don't like it. And it's all right to tell him that because uh, we have that, uh, you know, David. <laughs> if anybody gives us an example of that, it's David. Why do the nations rage against me? Why do my enemies prosper? Why, you know, read through the Psalms that he's written, and he, he does a lot of questioning. And it's not that he is necessarily shaking an accusing finger at God, but it may be more of just, I don't understand. 
I don't, I don't know why this is happening. And maybe he's pleading for an explanation or more importantly, pleading for something to change about that. And so <clears throat> I, I think the lesson here is all of us have difficult things that happen in our life. Uh, you know, whether it's financially loss of a job or whether it's loss of family members or somebody close to us or it's it's uh, health issues, cancer or whatever the case may be, surgeries, bad things that happen. And sometimes I think when we're in the midst of those, we struggle with those emotions that we have that are not necessarily just 24 hours a day praising God for what he's done for us. And are we saying, and can we say that that's okay? If you have, you're kind of tentatively shaking your head. There's not anything wrong with that. Marcia. Well, it's the difficult times that <clears throat> help us appreciate the good things that God has sure. for us. And that's probably why we have hard times. Sure, yeah, it's, it's the difficult things that make us appreciate God. Uh, James says, Count it all joy when you meet what? Temptation, Temptation tribulation, trouble. And that that verse just a, in a purely human sense just doesn't make sense, does it? Why should I be happy that I'm going through this? And it's not happy that I'm going through this, but it's happy for the opportunity I have to see, as he promised in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. How is that going to work for good for me? And the blessing of that is once you get through that whatever it is and you look back on it then you can say hmm that's pretty amazing how that turned out yeah I wasn't I didn't enjoy a bit of it it was terrible it was awful but I've grown because of it I've become more confident which leads me to the next major event in my life that maybe my faith's a little bit stronger in dealing with it God's going to get me through this too and so <clears throat> I think one of the main messages of this book is just that that constant faith through good times, through bad times, when there's plenty, when there's nothing, it's it's a matter of, you know, you got to trust that God's doing something. You don't have to like what's happening in your life, but never give up on our trust that he's got it covered, that we're still in his hands, that we're still being cared for, and we need to remember that even when our human mind is saying, I just don't like this flow. Uh huh. Because he says, the living, mm -hmm. she's living, Ruth is living. Yep. And then the dead, her husband were dead. Mm -hmm. So this gentleman was willing to reach out and help him with the relative, mm -hmm. to reach out to them and help them to try out the situation. So I think that's really pretty simple of what she was talking about there. Sure. Yeah. She's, her, her, Main blessing there is okay. Again, if if she's talking about Boaz, which I think she probably is, uh, he's, God's not forsaking His kindness because through Boaz, the living and the dead are going to be blessed as a result of what's going on. And again, if we take that in the different context and mean it to the Lord, it says something about her growing faith or her faith coming back to her and her confidence coming back to her as a result of that. All right. Thoughts, comments, questions. Dave. Could she be also talking about her husband and her son? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. The living and the dead as Elimelech and, and Malon and Chilion. I mean, take, uh, taking their lineage. You know. Right, their lineage will continue because the land will go out by Boaz and children will be raised in their name so that that lineage of that family continues on because for the ancient Jews, that was, that was kind of the thing, wasn't it? That the land passed on from generation to generation to generation was an evidence of their tie to God because he gave it to them. I was, just, I was just going to say, you know, <clears throat> if she was talking about the Lord, you would think she would have said, blessed be the Lord, mm -hmm. and blessed be he of the Lord. But he lives yeah. in his belief. She was talking about Boaz. Yeah, I think so. And, 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 and the reason I brought that is because several of the commentaries that you read, well, that's the line they take. And they say, but some say that, and, and it go into that other side of it. So, and either way, however you take it, it's truth. It's good. It's fine. Uh, I think the the wording itself, the way it is, especially in our English Bibles, he's talk. She's talking about Boaz, Jim, and then Flo. This uh, the word his is capitalized. Okay, which kind of gives you the idea of God. It it, it is. Uh, but the he is not. And again, careful 
when you see something capitalized in your English Bible. Because especially New Testament, the Greek were written in two types of, they were written in cursives, they were written in unseals. Unseals is all capital letters, uh, minuscules as they're sometimes called, uh, script, all lowercase. So they didn't capitalize the way we do. And especially when you hear and see the term spirit, is it the Holy Spirit? Is it talking about my spirit? Is it talking about the spirit of something? Uh, and translators will, in order to, to determine that, have to do a little bit of interpretation on their own, and sometimes they will capitalize spirit, but it probably shouldn't be capitalized. And that way you get the idea, okay, that's the Holy Spirit, when that's probably not what it's talking about. So we have to be careful. Plus, the, the capitalization of, of the, the references to God, he, him, uh, they, that really became a, a big thing in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, people didn't do that prior to that. And so as a result of that, that's kind of a modern English uh, language affectation uh, that happened. And so, again, so we have to be careful when we say, okay, that's not capitalized, that is, because uh, context will demand what it should be. But, I just want to say in the King James, it's not capitalized. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, again, uh, he is there and not capitalized. His kindness is capitalized, and that's New King James Version. Yeah. But, uh, Flo? You know, keep in mind, the book of Ruth is inspired by God. Mm -hmm. Example of some special women, Naomi, Ruth, etc. And we can look at it as a prophetic book. Yeah. So when you start looking at a prophetic book, then we take that language right there, so we start about Jesus. Yeah. Now, I just don't think it is. Okay. All right. Anything else? Bob? One thing to consider when they say, some people say, if you're making your living off of getting published, research something, mm -hmm. you're not going to make a dime rewriting the same old thing. So sometimes people will look for something new and different instead of uh, mm -hmm. going with the obvious. Yeah, yeah. You're exactly right on that. Um, get into theological works. And you'll notice quite quickly that some of the language and some of the works that are, are written by, again, guys much smarter than me, who know much more than me, but building on Bob's comment, they're trying to write something that's going to help people. Hopefully that's their motive to do it, but it's also going to be beneficial to them. And the phrase, it would seem, or it seems, that blah, 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 blah. And... You read through those, and it's like the entire argument is built around it would seem, it would seem, it would seem, rather than facts. And so, again, as long as you know that and understand that, you can deal with it. But uh, if every question raised becomes the new theology, then all we're doing is questioning and rather than learning from what the text says. All right? Other thoughts or comments? Yes. I think sometimes, um, like right now, I feel like I kind of like reel through all those things mm -hmm. and kind of uh, explain my first time for a stable and doing it for myself for the right reason. Mm -hmm. It kind of feels good, and there's so much more to learn. Um, and I can mourn back in for a second. Um, I'm not quite sure how much I've lost. Like I've lost more than I even realize mm -hmm. right now. So that would hurt. Like I have to deal with that. But it's a good feeling to be stable and doing it for myself. Therefore, I can rarely do work for sure. others. And maybe when, you know, they feel like coming around, they'll be around. Mm -hmm. And I have to be stable and found it. And mm -hmm. it may be more low. And right now is not the time. Yeah. And they have a beautiful family. They can do good. Yeah. It's a growing process. Yeah, it's a growing process. Exactly. And, uh, you know, difficulties can cause a lot of reactions. Uh, number one. The obvious one is we grow from it, we learn from it. The other side of that coin is we let it destroy us and destroy our faith. And and those are kind of the two responses. Uh, some people add to that list, well, just be indifferent to it, but I don't know how you can be indifferent uh, to things going on in your life. It's just it's impossible to do. So, uh, again, this, this whole, well, we, we've titled the study, The Book of Ruth, The Study of Hope and Redemption. Because that's what it's about. It's about hope and it's about redemption as a result of that hope. 
And I think that's a very powerful uh, message that we get from that. And that, that's the, the crux of this particular book, uh, why it's in there, and especially placed where it was right after the book of Judges, when the ju book of Judges was just so awful in the things what Israel was doing. And so it's, it's, it's a demonstration of, yeah, they're still good in the world, and there's still righteous people in the world, even when you don't seem to be able to see them uh, working in life. And that obviously would have application even in our modern world. Still good people out there. May not know who they are, may not see them. They may not be the vocal people that you hear, but there are good people out there, and we have to trust in that. And, uh, you know, people you come to worship with, it's good people. And, and we ought to revel in the fact that we can associate with good people. All right? Other thoughts or comments? Ellen. Well, one of the things that's interesting that we always need to talk about is the fact that the apostles, in fact, everybody throughout the history of the Word is always talking about, like you said, the redemption. That doesn't happen until we pass away. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can be redeemed, but throughout our whole lives, we see how people in the Bible had to suffer, how they had good times, how they had bad times, mm -hmm. and you have to compare that to your own life. We know we're going to get old. We know we're going to get sick. We don't know what we're going to get, but we know that whatever it is, with our faith in God, the reward comes at mm -hmm. our death. Yeah, yeah, and that idea of redeemed, I, I appreciate what you're saying there. Are we redeemed in Christ right now? Yes. Will we be redeemed in the future? In, in, in a different sense, isn't it? Because, again, like you say, when we die, we go on to be with the Lord. That is the full redemption that we experience, the, the then and the, the now and the then. We have redemption now. We are redeemed. But we won't experience that full redemption until we step through those pearly gates one day and live in the presence of God. And so there's that sense of, of yeah, we have it now, but it's not complete now until we are there in the future. All right? Any thoughts, comments, questions? All right, moving on to, uh, yeah, close relative. The word close relative there is the Hebrew word geal. And I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly. It's probably more of a guttural sound that I won't try. But it means redeemer. And so sometimes some versions will call it the kinsman slash redeemer. Others call it the redeemer. Uh, in the New King James, close relative. But the, the name there is significant. And once we kind of get through the text of Ruth, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the idea of redemption. Because that's obviously a huge Bible topic. And it's not just for the book of Ruth, but it's for everybody, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament. So we'll spend some more time with that when we get there. Uh, but the idea of being redeemed, what does it mean to be redeemed? Someone steps in for you and takes over. Okay, someone steps in for you. To buy back. To buy back. Okay. Uh, Boaz is going to buy the inheritance of Elimelech, Malon, and Chilion. He's going to offer it to the other near kinsmen, which we'll get to in a little bit, who, who's willing to do it until he finds out he's got to do Ruth too. And then for some reason, and we'll talk about that when we get there, he says, I can't do that. You do it. And Boaz is willing to do that. And so it's in a sense of, of, of buying back, of, of taking uh, the place of someone. It's, it's, I belong to this if I'm redeemed. I now belong to this. Uh, and so I, almost to put it in a terms of, of slavery, I'm bought from one master by another master. Isn't that salvation? And that's, that's the sense of salvation, isn't it? We, become, we quit being slaves to sin and become slaves to righteousness, to Jesus. And, you know, thinking in the sense of slavery, that sounds bad because slavery, as far as our modern culture, was an awful thing. But to be slaves of Jesus, that's a pretty good deal. That's a pretty good thing to have. And so this idea of redemption uh, is, is important in, 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 book, in, in the book, and that's why we say it's a study of hope and redemption. Yes? Um, would it be a slave or more so be a servant? Slave service. Like the, the, the Bible uses the term slave in the sense of... Of I'm a servant of Jesus, uh, and and yet my attitude is Jesus is my master. Therefore, what He asked me to do, I do. 
I do that. Dave? Well, I was just looking in at my Strong's and various uses in the authorized version for that Hebrew word, however you pronounce it. It seems to be like stepping up to the plate. And it's used as an avenger of blood mm -hmm. in Deuteronomy. Yeah. You know, in that case, a relative of someone who had been murdered, it was up to him to up to him or her to step up to the plate mm -hmm. to take it to take take God's vengeance upon that person. So, uh -huh. so that that's that's kind of I think I I think it's 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 like a, a family commitment to step up to the okay. plate. You know whether you whether it would be for a vengeance for for an avenger or whether it would be to to uh, take care of a man's family. Yeah, yeah. yeah under the Old Testament law. Uh, the family would have the right to avenge a death. Now, the person who was responsible for the death, what choice and option did they, that person have? Cities of refuge. Or go to the temple and, and grab a hold of the horns of the altar. And so that, uh, that, that concept is, I think like they said, just stepping up to the plate. Now, that... You know, again, all that's Old Testament law and, and all of that. We don't live under that anymore. But it's an idea of okay, as family, don't I have an obligation to you as family and you to me? And and that's that's what's that. Boaz had an obligation to his family, and he willingly took on that obligation. Yes. She's not just, well, not what she wants to Yeah, the Redeemer doesn't have to be. Yeah, yeah well, I, I think the point you're making is sometimes the Redeemer in this concept is not necessarily our own family because, you know, there are difficulties in families, families that don't get along, families that hate each other. The Redeemer can be anyone, regardless of their bloodline, who comes in and says, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? Ellen? Well, it's the same in the church family. You know, Jesus said, hey, whoever gives up their brother, sister, mother, grandmother, or whatever, you have them right here with you. Mm -hmm. This is our church family. We have the same responsible individually as redeemers ourselves to helping those in the church that have issues. If we see problems that they have, we need to address it. We need to step up. We need to serve. We need to help in any way that we can, in prayer, whatever it is. Find the brothers and sisters that are able to do these things all together to bring this person back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, again, it, it transcends bloodlines. Here we're talking about blood because that's the way the system was set up uh, in, in Israel for the, the redemption of, of the family lineage and the land and all of that. That's how it worked then. But you take that into a New Testament context under Jesus and it it becomes not bloodlines as far as family family, but it becomes the well, family of the human race, the family of the church who is you know, we are responsible for because that's, that's our family now. Uh, not just the people who are linked link to me through birth certificates. Uh, but we're linked to each other through the blood of Jesus Christ. All right? Other thoughts, comments? All right, so the close relative. Uh, verse 21. Ruth the Moabite said, He also said to me, You shall stay close to my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And then we said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with this young woman, young women, and that people do not meet you in any other field. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. And so again, uh, Boaz tells her, you, you stay right here. You stay close to me, the area and people I have control over, your safety, your security is involved in that, obviously, uh, and uh, don't go to other fields. 
because they may not know you or they may not, since they're not family, family may not preach you the way that they, and again, this is in the days of the judges. So we know what the, the climate of the culture was like during that time. And for a vulnerable woman who was a widow, who was a Moabite, how might she be treated by those who were not trying to do the will of God? Uh, take advantage of her or whatever they could do. And so Boaz seems to understand that and says, okay, you just stay with my people. Don't go to any other field. You stay here, and uh, you can stay here and glean until the end of the harvest. So this was going to be an ongoing thing for her. Until we get the harvest done, you stay with me, and uh, we'll, we'll just keep this up. And it says there she would uh, dwell with her mother-in-law. Uh, chapter 3. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? <coughs> now Boaz, whose young women you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself, wash yourself, anoint yourself, and put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go in, uncover his feet, and lie down, and he will tell you what you should do. And she said to her, All that you say to me, that I will do. That's how Kelly caught me. <laughs> <laughs> Woke up and she was laying at my feet. That's kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, custom wise, isn't that that doesn't fit with any anything that we we are used to. We have to understand this is a different culture than what uh, we live in and, and it's it, it's a little bit different but this is what she was instructed to do and what she was willing to do. Marcia? I'm just curious if Boaz had if he had other wives Good because question. It seems like some of the things that are said in there make you think that he did. Okay, it's possible. Uh, we know that God allowed for whatever reason multiple wives during this time. Did Boaz have others? He could have. Uh, we simply we can't answer that question. But it seems like the setting there is they're, they're threshing and they've got a place there where they just sleep. And they get up and they work the next day and they sleep and then they get up and work the next day. And it's, uh, who knows how far this particular property was from where Boaz actually lived. Uh, we don't know. He was a wealthy man, so he might have had a large estate. Uh, also, you have to keep in mind that you've got all this grain you're gleaning and somebody's got to keep an eye on it and make sure nothing happens to it. So you've got people staying there watching it. And uh, they didn't have a local elevator like we do today where the farmer would take it, sell it to them, and it's done with. Uh, so whatever was going on here, it's, it's, I find it interesting. I don't, not a single commentator has a really satisfactory answer as to where this custom came from. Uh, they, they try it. I had one professor uh, when I was doing my graduate work who, well, he was just a different kind of guy. So just to, I'll leave it at that. But he firmly believed, and I'll use a common term that you'll understand, this involved hanky-panky. I mean, that's, that's what he thought. He thought this was a, an overt, shall we say, sexual act uh, in, in that process. What do, you, what do you think? How would you respond to that, Dave? I wouldn't go that far, <clears throat> but the washing and the anointing, mm -hmm. um, she was definitely trying to make herself attractive. Sure. You know, so... Um, Naomi wanted Boaz to marry. Yeah, Ruth. Yeah, she was. Uh, I, I mean, he. So, yeah, I would. I wouldn't say that it was hanky panky, but I would. But I, 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 I. She was definitely. You know, and I think Boaz had already signaled her that. Yeah. Yeah, you're a good, nice looking lady, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> and I'm interested in in redeeming you if possible. Yeah. Yeah. Less. Whatever this process was, Boaz would have been familiar with it because she is told he will tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. So to me, this this is some type of symbolic action mm -hmm. that's showing Boaz that Ruth is placing herself under his protection. Yeah. And she, it may have been some type of ceremony that initiated this redeemer action mm -hmm. that we're not told about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and I think you're right. I think, again, I brought up my professor's idea because I just thought it was kind of strange. And uh, 
he had some other interesting, strange things that he taught. So, uh, uh, but uh, anyway, you know, whatever, however this came about, this seems to be the custom. Naomi knew what the custom was because she told him, go do this. When Boaz sees her there, he knows exactly what she's doing and responds as a result of that. Ruth wouldn't know this. Because... Exactly. Ruth's not from Israel, so she wouldn't know this. She wouldn't know the customs. And so Naomi's given her the custom. This is how you do it. And, uh, and the, again, you've got to keep in mind, there's a lot of people sleeping there. This is not like she went into his bedroom in his house where he was by himself and did this. This was where everyone was sleeping because when we get to a few verses later, she got up and left before anyone knew she was there. So it was this was a, a public place rather than, again, and uh, I, I, again, I brought up a professor because I thought it was just the weirdest thing I'd ever heard from a guy who's supposed to be a real you know, PhD and really smart. I don't know how he got there with that. But it was, go ahead, Jim. I'm thinking that... Uh... Like you said, this has got the wheels turning. Yeah. Because right away the next day, he knows he's supposed to start going to this other relative and making mm -hmm. So he, it's something that, like that Wes said, it signifies something. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was a process. And again, how this came about, if it was, you know, there were probably a lot of customs in Israel that weren't necessarily based on Scripture and what God told them to do because God told them what to do about their relationship with him. But just like a lot of customs that, that came up that, well, don't we have a bunch of customs that have nothing to do with Scripture? Traditions. Yeah, traditions, all sorts of things. And so that's that's what this is. And uh, I think we, we have to understand that. Uh, but again, as Dave pointed out, she gets herself all fixed up. This is She's not just, she hadn't worked in the field all day and just laid down at his feet. She came in specifically, probably looking a whole lot different than all the other people and other women who were there. Probably smelled pretty good. Yeah, probably smelled a lot better. Uh, but she had this purpose in mind, and that purpose wasn't anything to do with the gleaning. It was everything to do with um, catching Boaz's attention. And as Les said, she slept at his feet. What kind of does that symbolize? Respect, Respect submission, submission uh, humility. Uh, and again, weird way my mind works. Boaz has been working in the field all day. Would you want to sleep by his feet? I don't think so. Maybe maybe she did. I, I don't know. But it's <laughs> she, she she could. She uncovered him and possibly he she had cleaned his feet. I, I don't know. But it's again it's an act of submission. It's an act of of here I am, I'm giving myself to you in that sense of 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 humility. Pam? Sure. Sign of a marriage proposal. Women in the Bible could ask men to marry them. That's what that says, isn't it? Kind of. No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, all the men in her family are gone, so there was no male person like a dad to make these kind of arrangements, and so she had to do that. Uh, so, again, a lot about this we don't know, but the basic crux of all of this is Naomi said, this is how you let him know you're interested, and this is what you do. That's what Ruth did, and Boaz understood it for what it was. And uh, we'll get to that as we keep going on through the, through the book. <clears throat> yes? There's still some good advice there uh, from Naomi who says, bottom line, let his physical needs be met. I'm not talking sexually. I'm yeah. talking about until he has finished eating and drinking. Mm -hmm. That's still good advice today. Don't ask for something when your husband's hungry. Okay. All right. All right. A couple of things I'd like to say about that, but I'm not even touching that with a 10 foot pole. So, John. Huh? She said it's still good advice to not ask your husband for something until he's eaten and drink, drink. Yeah. <laughs> alright any other comments okay so she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her and after Bo has it eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain and she came softly and covered his feet and lay down now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself and there was a woman laying at his feet 
And he said, Who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Okay? So she does exactly like she's supposed to do. And about midnight, he wakes up, and it's like, Oh, something's wrong. Something's off here. And he's got a woman laying at his feet. And he, I'm assuming it's dark. I'm assuming she can, he can't see who she is. So he asks, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. And again, the custom is implied here because what does she say? Take your maidservant under your wing for you are a close relative. She had probably been coached by Naomi to say this. This is why I'm doing this. This is why I'm at your feet. This is my request of you. And so again, part of that whole custom, whatever that was. John? Also, it, it, it says that she kind of belongs there. It's not just somebody who's who's telling them, hey, take care of me, dude. Yeah. You know, uh, you're, you're a close relative. It, it's kind of like she's explaining to her. Church. She's couching it in the rules and the laws of the land. This is, I'm not just, I just don't find you handsome and I want you as my husband. This was part of the culture as far as uh, the lineage and all of that, the Leviat marriage that we've talked about, that's all part of this. And so she had been schooled into saying, uh, take your maidservant under your wing for your close relative. That's what's going to happen. Steve? Probably worth noting that she's not trying to trap him either, you know, because you could read this in the modern terms and be like, oh, well, she's just setting him up for some reason. But that's not, yeah. not the deal. No, no. Had she gone to some other man, yeah, she might be trying to set him up. I'm a poor widow, I'm a Moabite, take me in, and, and kind of John's comment, just take care of me. No, this was the near kinsman as specified by law, and she's letting her request be made known to him that this is what the law requires and demands, and I'm asking you to do what the law commands. And so it's a, it's a formal request uh, for the system that they, they lived under at that point in time. I'm yeah, sorry. go ahead. Symbiotic as well. Yeah. You know, she didn't start off with, hey, you have to do this because you're a close relative. It was, I'm your maid servant. I'm here to do things for you, and, and I need you to take care of me. Yeah, it was it was a, a commitment of their two roles together. It wasn't like she said, take me in so I can eat bonbons and crumpets all day long in my nice house. And You know, it, it wasn't one of those things where she just wanted to be taken care of. She's wanting to continue the lineage of her husband and Naomi's husband and all of that that's involved in that. It's, it's much bigger than just a love relationship, if you will. That's kind of weird to say because love relationships are big deals. But this that wasn't the driving force behind that. It was the fulfillment of the law and the fulfillment of, of family. And he said to her, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning. And that you do not go after young men, whether rich, poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. All right. Last two bells. Dave, final word. We'll quit here. Uh, I just seem to remember <clears throat> somewhere in Leviticus or Deuteronomy or something about the kins, the, the widow approaching the kinsman and if he refused to, uh, to, to his obligation that she had the right to spit in his face or something like yeah, that. Yeah. In other words, this this was a legal right which Ruth, which Naomi advised Ruth, don't go about it that way, you know. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, but, exactly. And there's, in, I can't remember where it is, there's an instance where a man took a woman under these circumstances but refused to do what he needed to do to get her pregnant. And God didn't appreciate that. Uh, we're out of time. We'll talk more about that next week. Thanks for being here this morning.